All right, welcome to our next week of Trinity Sunday School as we move past creation uh, into the fall in the aftermath. And uh, we get this picture, and again, if we think of Genesis 1 through 11 especially as giving us this big macro level picture of why the world is the way it is, um, we get some key parts of that in today's story. And from the stories we've just been telling about the broken things in the world that uh, can go wrong, uh, people have always asked the question, why is it the way it is? Uh, and Genesis 3 and 4 are going to give us some of those answers. Uh, so let me see if I can get the text up for us. Um, all right, here we are. In, in, this is one of those tricks we have to play with ourselves. Whenever I would assign these passages to students, uh, I would give them the task to read them like they were a new hearer or reader of the passage and they'd never heard it before. So we have this mental ability uh, when we hear things that we've heard before, when we read things we've read before, we've already filled in all the gaps. And we've already heard so many things about it. We have this construct in our heads uh, that sometimes um, this is uh, some of the key parts that are going on in the story. So try to pretend you're coming at this for the first time um, instead of like the thing you've probably heard 500 times from Sunday school uh, through adulthood. All right, so chapter three, remember we just had the two, we just had the two stories of creation, uh, and then we are being, um, we had the transition I talked about with the people were naked, and then the word play with that for the crafty uh, or tricky serpent. So here we go. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, which right off the bat, we'll get into that. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, remember, we didn't hear that. We heard a specific tree they weren't supposed to eat from. But the serpent says, you're not supposed to eat from any trees? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. Now, there's something fun in reading texts uh, in conversation with each other. And if we go back to the last chapter, God does say not to eat from the tree in the middle of the garden, the garden of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, not an apple tree like we get in the cartoons, but from the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil. Uh, but notice here, it says, you shall not even touch it or you will die. Now, the rabbis have a lot of fun talking about this because they're like, well, where does, that, where does that rule come from? Because clearly that's not what God said one chapter earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the ways people talk about it is that this was like the beginning of the creating, you know, the fence around Torah, the rules around the rules so you don't break the real rule. If you can't touch the tree or touch the fruit, you won't accidentally eat it, right? So like there's already a boundary. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the serpent counters this, and the rabbis say this beginning part where he says, you won't die. Uh, they argue that the serpent pushed her into the tree, and she hits it, and, and he's like, look, nothing happened. You're not going to die. Uh, but again, that's what the rabbis do sometimes, where they're reading between the lines, things that aren't in the text. But they're trying to explain these, these differences. But anyway, so right away, this serpent challenges her. And he says, yeah, you're not going to die. God just doesn't want you to know uh, all of this, or you will be like God. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband, who was there with her, and he ate it. And the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Let me just stop here, and I want us to play this, this uh, little exercise 
you heard this a million times. You've probably seen it a million times in like little cartoony kind of uh, versions and Sunday school kind of things. When you see this scene, what do you picture? What's in your head? Who's there? What's it look like? What's going on? Because I think some of the text counters some of the things we, in many familiar ways, think we see when we read this passage. Kathy? I, I, I noticed this time, for the first time, that it said he was, that Adam was standing next to her. So why, I wonder, we, I always think of it just the serpent and Eve, but instead her husband who was with her. So why is he not in this dialogue up at the top? Very good question. We, we historically, in, in this passage, it's typically the woman made a mistake and screwed the whole thing up, and now here we are, right? That's a certain layer of history of interpretation. And it's sometimes explained, like, well, she comes up with this piece of fruit, and the poor guy, he's got no idea what it is. He just eats it. But that's not the way it literally reads. It's like she takes it, she eats it, and she gives it to the man who's there with her. And, and so that, that's a very different dynamic, um, shifting this story. So that's a very good point. We typically only vision this as a serpent and a woman talking where the man is nowhere to be found. Anything else strike you about this? Or anything else strike you as odd about this? Or surprising? There's something that should be surprising that we've heard this too many times, so it's not. The serpent talks. To me, what's weird is that, so everything's good, you know, God made everything and it's good, but when their eyes are open and they see they're naked, that's bad. Like, what? Yes, <laughs> that's and exactly right. I've heard television ministers who preach that the serpent, was became like a man to entice the woman oh, because probably. he is the most beautiful of creatures right. prior to his fall and that it wasn't just a serpent on the ground talking to somebody it was the form of a human because the devil can do a lot of things okay there's about three really good things in there. So first, why is this serpent talking? Like most of us, we don't bat an eye at that, right? Because we've read it so many times and we go to fairy tale land where it's like animals just talk, I guess. I remember Julie reading to the boys when they were really little. I mean, like five, six, four, five, six, maybe. And it was one of those moments where it's a children's Bible. She's reading this and Peter just starts laughing. And she's like, what's the matter? He goes, that's really funny. The, the snake was talking. And Jake, right, the little engineer mind, you know, <laughs> that's not funny. The serpent was talking, and right, he just goes into this one. And Pete just keeps laughing. He goes, no, this is funny. Like, the snake is talking. And then it, it hit me, like, for the first time, like, when ancient people heard this, did that bring a chuckle? Because right, we go into this place in our minds where it's like, well, ancient people were like children who aren't sophisticated and like they never probably encountered a talking snake either. But we just write that, oh yeah, you know, back then the snakes were talkers. <laughs> That's the thing hanging out there. The, the comment about the devil, if we just say we're reading a text for the text's sake, is there any reason to think this is anything other than a snake? Are there any clues in the text that would say it's more than a snake? Are there clues in the text that would tend to make us think it can't be anything more than a snake? Who grew up with a tradition that said, this is the devil in the form of a snake. Did you hear that? Right. And I don't, I don't want to like totally poo poo that. I mean, there's, there's reason for that. 
But when you read this story by itself, that actually doesn't make a lot of sense the way the narrator tells it to us. The people are getting tricked by the snake. But why is that happening? Well, he says at the beginning, because the snake was the craftiest creature in the garden. Well, if it's the devil trying to trick them, it's really interesting. You'd think he would use the dumbest animal in the garden so they wouldn't see it coming. And the other really weird thing is in, the, in this whole passage, if the serpent was nothing more than a costume for the devil, why do snakes get cursed at the end? That feels extremely unfair. <laughs> but but we'll, get to that. we'll get to that later. They eat, and the moment they eat, they realize they're naked. Some of the- Wondered, how did they know what parts to cover? That they only made loincloths. They didn't put sleeves on or a hat or. That's right. They, they knew the parts you weren't supposed to be seeing, right? Yeah. How do they know that? Well, it's really interesting because this idea of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Um, there's a lot of there. There's there's a lot of um, conversation throughout scholarship about what's that all about. And most would argue that it's a, a metonymy, right? When we say night and day, we don't just mean the nighttime, the daytime, but like midday doesn't count. It like counts for all time. And so this idea of good and evil, some have suggested this is like all kind of moral understanding, right? So it's not just they learned the bad things, they learned the good, but it became this whole this idea we even think in our own culture of, you know, there's like a an age of an accountability where all of a sudden we know some things are right to do and some things are not right to do. Um, I often tell this story when um, the kids were really little and there was a teacher making home visits who we had over for dinner and the kids, two of the kids were in school, Abe was like preschool and you can't tell him I told you this story, but Abe comes running he had to go take a bath and he literally, this ends up being his kindergarten teacher like two years later. He like comes running through the kitchen like buck naked with his towel, right? And everybody just cracks up, right? Cause it's this little three-year-old running through naked. Now if he comes running through 17 year old naked, everybody's like, you know, something's terribly wrong and like call the police, right? So, um, but there's this idea we all have in our minds that there's this point at which you know better. And the way Genesis 3 almost describes this, this encounter, it's, it's almost as if Adam and Eve have this moment of awakening. Really, it says their eyes open and they realize, like, wait, what are we doing? It's like they just transitioned from childhood to adulthood. And they realize there are certain parts of our bodies that we're to cover up. And this becomes a really big thing in Judaism about shame and nakedness and that i mean even to the point where you know there are in, in real extreme sects of judaism uh we're really in marital relationships even it's like there's people don't see each other naked that's seen as shameful and so this story becomes kind of that and this explains why we feel ashamed when we're naked and so this is the this is the sign in this story that something went really wrong that all of a sudden the people are like at a different place of understanding, okay? And so let's look then at the response. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at that time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And again, notice this is really interesting, right? When people feel shame, what do we do, right? We hide and we cover up. And so like in a really profound way, here we are at the beginning of Genesis, seeing this human response to shame. And the Lord God called in the man and he said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And you get this great moment, like the kid who says too much, and all of a sudden, it's like, whoops, 
oh, and he's like, well, how did you know? And then he realized, and then here comes the next part of when we sin and have shame. What does he do? The man said, the woman, and it's not just the woman he's blaming, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate, right? So it was a double blame. The woman did it and kind of you did it. All right, and then what happens? The Lord said to the woman, what is this that you've done? The woman said, the serpent tricked me and I ate. Now here's the one weird thing about this passage that always makes me smile is the little chatty, little chatty serpent who's talking it up. Like if there was ever a time for him to talk, like this would be it, right? Everybody else is blaming everybody. He should say something, but silence. The Lord God said to the serpent, and notice we go poetic. Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat, and all the days of your life I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. And he will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. All right, so God goes into curse mode, and first curse goes to serpents. And it's like, now you're going to grovel around, your face is in the dirt. There's going to be enmity between you and humans. He's going to, you know, smash your head and you're going to bite at his heels. And we get this paradigm of this is the way, right? Again, this is what this kind of literature. So why is it that people and snakes just don't get along? Well, here it is, right? Cursed from the beginning. Now, some... Uh, have looked at this passage 315 and they've expanded it into a prophetic passage because once the later tradition comes about that says the serpent is really the devil then chapter 3 verse 15 gets read as a messianic passage alluding to Jesus a human and the serpent is the devil. And how he will, you know, crush the head of the devil, but he will wound him. So in some traditions, people say the first prophecy in the Bible is 315. Um, but realize that there takes a lot of, a lot of layers of reading uh, to see it that way in a broader context. We don't see it that way just in Genesis. But when one reads the Bible all put together with Hebrew Bible, New Testament, through Christian lens, you go, oh, that could be shattered. <laughs> Next up, to the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. All right, so we get some more explanations. Explanation one, why do snakes and people just can't get along? Two, why is bringing forth life such, not just painful, but again, if you think of most of the history of the world, one of the most dangerous acts for humans to go through is giving childbirth. And think about that. What, what is like a really strange irony about that? How is it that so often giving birth brings possibly death? Well, it's because of this. Help me understand, right? Why is there patriarchy in the world? If you're a woman saying, why are these men always like this? Why are they always over us? Why is it this way? It points to this. Then he says to the man, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, 
you are dust and to dust you shall return. So for the man, we're told, there are now be thorns and thistles in the ground. You will only produce, this is good in agricultural here, right? You will only produce your bread by hard work. And in the end, you will die and go back to the dirt I made you out of. Which again, we don't, we hear people being spoken into existence in, in Genesis 1. Genesis 2, they're being formed from the dirt, right? So 2 and 3 clearly go together. And you came from dirt, you're going back to dirt. Okay? So this is what is historically called the curse. And it's also called the fall, right? So we fall from God's grace and favor. And this is the outcome. But it goes one step further. Let me show this last part, and then I want us to talk about this a little bit. We talked about the power of naming. And again, here we get a name change. The man named his wife Eve, Chava in Hebrew, which sounds like life, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and his wife and clothed them. So why are we wearing clothes? Well, here's the reason. Then the Lord said, see, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And again, going back to Carl's question, we go to this plural again. The man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. So God dispossesses them of this garden because he says, the last thing we want now is for them to eat from the tree of life and never die. Now, it's interesting. We weren't told not to eat of that. No one realized death was a possibility, so there was no desire to eat it. But now that they've been cursed to death, God's like, well, we have to do something. Let me tell you one ancient Near Eastern story, which has interesting resonances with this, and then I want us to talk a little bit about this. Um, in the Gilgamesh epic, when Gilgamesh is trying to find eternal life. He's on this journey. And at one point, somebody says, if you go to this place, at the very ends of the earth, you will find a bush that produces fruit. And if you eat of that fruit, you will live forever. So Gilgamesh goes on this long journey. He gets to this place. He sees the plant. He sees the fruit. And in an instant, a serpent comes up out of the ground, eats the fruit, <clears throat> and goes back down. Very different from what we've just read here. But in this interesting parallelism, a serpent causes a scenario which snatches away life from humans. Eternal life was there to be had. And because of a serpent, they lose it. Okay? And I want to show you one other... I want to show you something else real quickly, and then I want us to discuss this. So we've, I've used this image a lot. We've talked about it a lot. Um, when we talked about creation, we talk about this is this image, right, of the way the garden and life was created, where there were perfect bonds between humans and God. He's walking around in the garden every day. Humans and humans, they are, they are partners suitable for each other in perfect harmony, and all is right with nature. And in this one chapter, all this falls apart, right? There's enmity between God and humans, and God kicks the humans out of the garden. We now have a power imbalance between the man and the woman. And we have thorns, thistles, biting snakes, and ultimately death. And the whole rest of the story of the Bible is how do we undo what happens in this moment? Okay. So let's talk for a bit. So you read this story or you hear this story. You've heard it many times before. So a couple things. What strikes you differently? And to what, to, what level do you read this passage and say, 
This relates to our life, our thinking, or it should maybe in ways that it maybe hasn't before. We think of this as just a children's bedtime story, but are there ways in which this relates to our own living and relating to God, each other, and to nature? Thoughts? I see the the role of free will and human bad choices. Yeah. Yeah. But it it doesn't sound like a very grace filled God either. Or is it? Because he he relocates them and he gets some clothing and he gives them a way to make a living. So. Right. So I see it as a, a vengeful God, but maybe I need to read it a little differently. A good question. Thoughts about that? Well, um, I think my point of view has changed over the years. You know, when I first heard this and I was real little, all I could think about is, well, he told you not to eat it and you went ahead and did it. And so you got exactly what you deserved. Why are you complaining? Okay. So then maybe take you right to today, but earlier than this, really. There's a different point of view. So I always try to read Bible passages, placing myself in that passage to figure out, well, which character would I be? And so um, I'm pretty sure I would have been Adam or Eve, just, wow, this is, tree is beautiful. The fruit looks so great. If I eat, eat this, I will be as good as God. I will be wise and wonderful, and I can do good for others, and everything's going to turn out well in the future so why wouldn't you want to eat that fruit and so i think i would be the person who would gladly eat that fruit only to find out i followed the wrong person so or the wrong serpent so if you say well how does that relate to us today i think it behooves us to uh, do our research to if wherever that leads us to figure out, well, who, whom should we listen to? Because there are a lot of voices out there, um, which are the voices that continue to be God-like or Christ-like, and listen to them. Mm. Good. I think I see a more, not a vengeful God, but a disappointed and irritated God. And usually when you're irritated, you get you're mad, you say something, and then all of a sudden it's kind of gone, and you're, okay, fine, let's, let's work things out, rather than Vengeful to me sounds like, man, we're going down till the death, and this, you know, it's going to be a final, final struggle. So I see disappointment in not following the instructions and irritation and consequences, but not any more than that, really, at this point. The question I always like to wrestle with is, did the serpent lie, or did the serpent tell the truth? Oh, and why? Or did the serpent do both? Look at what he says. And the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will know good and evil like God, and you surely will not die. Well, and that's where I'm confused, because it, the idea is when they get sent out, then they could die. But then also it, in here, it said that I, I am confused by this, where he says, you know, you can't let the man keep eating or you can't let the man eat it from it because then he'd live like us forever. Well, he already ate from it. So that's another implied. tree It's referring to. There's also a tree of life. So there's the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Oh, OK. We made, we made as humans the bad mistake of not eating from the tree of life first. <laughs> from the other tree could be golden right but oh. we made a bad choice but then that implies so it's kind of interesting so apparently god and them eat from this tree but adam and eve never saw him eat from that tree mm -hmm. which so that's confusing to me too it's like okay how did they never because if they did then they go well i'd already be going huh 
God eats from that tree. Yeah. I wonder why we can't eat. And it's obviously not killing him. So. Right. And we don't know if God eats from it or God is just that way. So he doesn't need to eat anything. But then it says they have to be like that. Okay. And that's probably where I'm getting all confused yeah. with the, what does be like it, them mean. Right. <laughs> When I think about it, if I step back, it seems rather silly. And I know that many would see that as sacrilegious. But here, it looks like God set up this test. And it sounds like a game show almost. Like, which door do you choose? And like, but, it's reality you know, too. there's more wisdom and, and truth in there than that. But there's yeah. that so for me. Well, it does right. say that, God kind of set up the original temptation. Mm -hmm. Like, why? Why? There's definitely a moral dilemma, mm -hmm. like, through and through in this, in this account. And it's interesting because if you even look at theologians going back to ancient times as they wrestle with this passage, mm -hmm. see it as, in the end, humans had to eat it because that becomes part of them becoming fully who they would develop into and we're supposed to be. Otherwise, we just continue on in a childlike state and never fully develop and mature. And we have the kind of moral reasoning, right? Like we think of ourselves as these beings with deep moral reasoning. And some say, well, that's possible only once they cross this threshold. Has anyone seen the movie the Truman Show with Jim Carrey and his whole life is videotaped. This is like proto reality TV. Like you go, oh, this is actually kind of happening now. But his whole life is being watched. And it is this like Edenic state. I mean, think about his name, Truman, like the true man. And it's being watched and manipulated and then this godlike director who's watching and directing the show and making things happen his name is Christoph um, and Truman is fighting to get out of the show at the end when you realize what's going on you get if the Bengals game starts going sideways and you have to come up with something to do this afternoon watch the Truman show because there's this powerful thing that you find yourself rooting for this guy and you think on one level, he's an Adam Eve character who's trying to break free from a garden because then his life, even though it's hard and it's complex and there's hurt and pain, is more being fully human uh, than what we would experience in this childlike way in a garden. So there are just tensions and complexities, which again, when we hear this story as a child, it's pretty simple. But I think there are layers of depth to this story as we think about who we are and what we're called to be. The same way I always ask the question, was the serpent right when he says, in the day you eat it, you won't die? Because nobody fell over dead. I mean, the story says we're going to eventually die, and we do. <clears throat> This is one of those things, and I love this. I find the Bible very much like Shakespeare, in that you can do a nice surface reading of the story, and the people who were in the theater back in the day found it fun and funny and sometimes bawdy, and Shakespeare was good entertainment. But there's another layer through the text that has us wrestling and debating and thinking hundreds of years later. How much more scripture, right, that this God breed text to challenge us. We have good stories for little kids that say, so just like they should have obeyed God, you should obey your parents. Um, but then we have these layers to which we still wrestle about what is God calling and expecting of us? And why is our urge always to push beyond that boundary? And to keep challenging the things we're being told. How are we on time? I'm going to do a bunch of chapters, but I feel like I maybe got into my bad habit of Any, anything else about chapter three. 
Let's um, quickly. I'm not seeing the screen right or the verse right now, but I think it's verse 22. And God says, "Let us." I think. Yes. Who is, who is that? This is back to this was the question that mm -hmm. Carl asked last week, couple weeks mm -hmm. last week. It's again. It's either it's either the royal we, yeah, um, or God's got other people in a divine council up there around him that he's talking to. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're going to see it one more time at the Tower of uh, Babel, Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. So we have our flaming, sworded um, cherubs, hurting Eden, and again another great literary. Uh, phrase here with East of Eden, which is, yeah, I, I think there's probably a better chance this afternoon that you watch the Truman Show that you sit down with Steinbeck. But again, <laughs> if you reread East of Eden and this, this whole dilemma, which we'll go into this next chapter, which I just want to read through real quickly and give us something to think about. Um, Let's shift over to another very famous story that we know, but again, I think there are layers of complexity that we haven't thought about before. Not to make too much of this, but as the two people who we said just had this transition of moral understanding and probably maturity and understanding, it's all of a sudden we have them uh, realizing they're more than just partners. Uh, now the man knew his wife Eve and she conceived and bore Cain saying, I have produced it's a little bit of a word play there. It's like a pun more than literally produced. I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next, she bore his brother, Abel. And Abel's name means like vapor mist which it's like ooh, that's nice uh you should have seen it coming now abel was a keeper of sheep and cain a tiller of the ground in the course of time cain brought the lord an offering of the fruit of the ground and abel for his part brought the firstlings of his flock their fat portions and the lord had regard for abel and his offering but for cain and his offering he had no regard so Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. And that phrase right there, uh, East of Eden wrestles with, is it you can, you must, um, I won't blow the outcome of the Chinese scholar who went off to study Hebrew for two years and figured it all out. Um, Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you have driven me away from the soil, and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and anyone who meets me may kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and send, settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Now, this passage has probably even more complexities and questions hanging over it 
uh, than the last one. Um, you have two brothers, different kinds of jobs. They each bring a sacrifice. God accepts one, doesn't accept the other. And then when he doesn't accept the offering of the one, he says, why are you so upset? Oh, I guess mad, kills his brother. God asks him, and this is a good question, does God know what's happened or is God really asking? Just like did God know why and where the people were hiding? Was he really asking or was he doing that thing when we see our kid stole all the cookies with crumbs on their mouth and said, who ate the cookies? Um, same question here. Does God know what's happening? And is he just being poetic when he says he hears the blood crying out? Or does he hear the blood crying out? He casts him out again, right? God keeps expelling people. But when he sends this man out, um, who's he worried about going to get him? Hold all those questions in your head because it gets even better. So Cain wanders away, right? Verse 17, Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and named it Enoch after his son Enoch. Then it goes into our first solid people genealogy. The Enoch was born Erad. Erad was the father of Mahuyael, and Mahuyael the father of Methuselah. Methuselah the father of Lamech. Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada. The name of the other was Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the ancestor of those who live in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the ancestor of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. Zillah bore Tubal Cain, who made all kinds of bronze and iron tools. The sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. And then it goes on in this genealogy. Um, let me drop down one more time. Verse 25 Adam knew his wife again. She bore a son and named him Seth, for she said, God has appointed for me another child instead of Abel because Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. At that time, people began to invoke the name of the Lord. All right, and that, that ends our chapter here. Um, but we have this interesting thing. So we have two brothers, and they kill each other. And it feels like all we have on the earth is two parents and two children. But the next thing they're worried about, who's going to get us when we're wandering? And a guy has more kids, and then he builds a city in a place called Node, which in Hebrew is wander, right? He said, I don't want to be a wanderer. So it's like he builds a town called Wandersville. Um, <laughs> and so let me just, let's just ask a few questions of the text. And again, you've heard this, you've read it. You've seen flannel graphs on it. Um, if, stuff from Sunday school. If, if they go to poetry when things are important, yeah, Why yeah, yeah. The little stanza of Lamech so important. Yeah, this is a good question. Ada Zilha, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, 77-fold. There's something going on there. Um, about vengeance and violence. And there's this whole blood vengeance thing, right? Like we talk about, well, the Bible teaches us some would, right? Some would say, well, you know, why do we have capital punishment? Well, the Bible teaches, right? That you have to avenge, you know, people who are murdered. This is more like, this is more like, um, what, what would I call this? It's, it's, it's like family feud vengeance killing. The law doesn't take part. You need to avenge the people in your household who are murdered by others. Um, why this gets highlighted out, like this is clearly some kind of important passage or stanza 
But the weird thing is the Bible puts it in there. And other than showing that the world becomes so violent in our next chapter, that God's going to wipe out the whole world. This thing about Lamech and Cain, um, we don't have any other references to. So this is something that if you went back to original hearers, there might be a whole tradition around this. We just don't know what it is. Or I will say, I don't know what it is. I'll do some more look, uh, looking to see if the rabbis have anything to say about this uh, or if there's anything in commentaries, but it doesn't pick up the flow of our story. Only in that we're going to hear about the world is so violent now. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But yeah. these specific characters, other than the reference to Cain, we don't know much about. Um, all right, we're almost 11. Let me just ask one last question. In your minds and what you've heard and what you've seen in your lives on this passage, why does God accept Abel's offering and not Cain's? What's it about? Because everybody's ration, we say we have to rationalize a way to say God doesn't like that guy's gift. And the question is, do we have clues, hints, explanations? The Lord, from the beginning, he killed the animals to make the sin covering for the man. Okay. And Jesus Christ gave his blood for our redemption. There's been a blood element from the beginning. And Cain did not have a blood element in his sacrifice. It was strictly a grain sacrifice. Okay. Good. So one, one explanation is that blood sacrifice versus another kind of offering, which is interesting because later on, Israelites are going to have all kinds of sacrifices, blood sacrifices, animal sacrifices, grain sacrifices, oil sacrifices, so, that, so that's a good explanation, but it begs the other question of why. Is one seen as more elevated, which is true. A blood sacrifice is considered a more weighty kind of a sacrifice. You don't have a blood sacrifice when you're a farmer. What's that? You would he didn't have that option. His role was to till the ground. That's, that's right. So it's like you sacrifice what you have. So it's the, yeah. on one level of the, of the metaphor and, it, and actually more than metaphor in the ancient mindset, oftentimes about sacrifices, it's that you're feeding the gods. And so, you know, it could be as simple as, hey, God prefers a steak than a salad, right? He's, he wants meat and he just has a preference because you're right. They're both sacrificing what they have. What else? Anything else come to mind? Well, that's one of those places where I think God might have been wrong <laughs> because okay. he, he didn't honor the, the farmer's sacrifice as much as the shepherd's sacrifice. Um, but um, maybe, maybe he thought that, you know, if you look at, if, if you look at an animal, and you look at um, a plant, you, you're, you're clearly more wrapped up in the life of an animal than you are the life of a plant. Okay. So, so maybe he would look, we would look at it that way, and maybe God did too. Although, honestly, it seemed like he didn't honor the sacrifice of the farm. Okay. Um, I gave, I'll give him a negative mark for that. <laughs> <laughs> here's um now I, here's an interesting this is for some of you this has been influenced um by the new testament's reading of this right so the way the rabbis respond to things and the rabbis build interpretation around it it broadens our overall understanding and reading of a passage well the writer of hebrews comments on this passage and in commenting on it, 
it also influ influences how we think about it. Even though I don't know that we see any evidence of this in the text, it's clearly a reading. Hebrews 11.4 says, By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God gave approval to all his gifts. And by faith, he still speaks, even though he is dead. There is this, we have, I grew up with an interpretation around this that said, this was about the attitude of the heart of the giver of the offering. Um, I don't know that I see that actually in the text, other than it says that Abel brought the, Abel brought the firstlings and the fat portions, which it says, oh, that's a really good gift. But we don't hear anything negative about the grain. But so some have, through the Hebrew lens, say, well, what we should take away from this is it's like there were attitudes of the two and how and why they gave. Okay? That's, if you ever hear that, and you go, I don't see that in the text. That's coming through reading it in light of Hebrews. There's something else that we're going to see in Genesis, but we're also going to see it throughout, um, throughout the reading of the Hebrew Bible through the Old Testament. God always chooses the younger, right? He chooses um, Isaac over Ishmael. He chooses Jacob over Esau. He chooses Joseph over his older brothers. He chooses David, right, over the older brothers. And some have said, well, this is the beginning of the pattern. God has a favorite, and it's the younger, which turns on its head the way of ancient Near Eastern and even modern culture, right, that the firstborn gets everything. Some have said, well, maybe it's simply that Cain uh, is the older and Abel is the younger. He's the underdog. There's also another layer to this. The ancient Israelites are herders. And they often have a very negative view of the cities and the civilization and the agricultural life. And some have said this is like a deeper sociological statement about herder folk versus city folk. And that God is with, and think about our patriarchs, right? They're the wanderers who move around with their herds. And they're always warned about the people in the cities. Um, there's no simple answer to this. I'm going to throw one more into the mix, which is weird. No one ever brings it up. But to me, it's the most text-centered answer. Is the chapter before, God had just cursed the ground, which would bring forth all this stuff. And there's some wonder if the idea that the cursed ground brings forth grain, and of course, God would look at that offering differently than he would look at an animal. But there is no simple explanation to this other than it clearly causes tension. And in the midst of the tension, the line is, sin is lurking at the door. You must overcome it. And clearly that did not happen. <laughs> it was the exact opposite. We have no good answer for why God does what God does. But we do know the line that you better not be overcome by sin lurking at the door. Uh, which again is this great ancient picture. They had fear that there were everything from baby snatching demons to all other kinds of things which were in the thresholds of doors which is why the mezuzah is put on the door frame. It's why in ancient Jericho, they put decorated skulls of babies underneath the threshold of door. It's why you all, even though you didn't realize what you were doing, you were playing part of some ancient mythic fear as you carry your bride across the threshold the first time, um, which has interesting pagan roots, but we'll go through that another time. That's not a story for Sunday morning. Um, 
but this this tension of sin crouching at the door and it desires you but you must master it and throughout this entire throughout this entire book of genesis and beyond will be these stories of how do we master it and then we get to the new testament and paul and we hear you're not going to master it right paul says the thing i know to do <laughs> you know that thing i don't and the thing i know i shouldn't i still do it the only way we master this is through Christ in whom there is no longer any condemnation. Well, I've, I've gone far. I know you all have Sundays to, um, <laughs> to experience. But any last uh, comments or questions that's hanging out there before we go? Sorry for keeping you long. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you for your goodness, for your blessing. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you that even in our sin, even in our falling, even in our brokenness, you continue to find ways to provide, to love us, to give us new opportunities and new chances. God, let us hear your words in, your, in our hearts. Help us to continue to be more closely shaped into your image, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you. You too. We'll go, through the, we'll go through the next few chapters of Noah next week, and we'll see what happens when sin and violence continue in the land. Thank you. All right. Thank have you. a great week. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. See ya. See ya.